It's my pleasure to, to welcome Graham Denham from the University of Western Ontario, who will speak to us today about Milner fibers of hyperplane arrangements. Well, thanks very much for the invitation, Dave. Um, good to see you guys here. Um, it looks like I've got some students in the audience, so, um, you know, I, I'd send me some signals if it, one way or the other, if it doesn't seem to be going your way. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to assume any background with hyperplane arrangements particularly, um, but I, I suppose there's some algebra and topology around here, um, some singularity theory. Thanks, Dave. Um, so maybe, oh yeah, and I'm allowed to spell fiber because I'm Canadian in the correct way, so um, <laughs> make sure no one corrects me. Um, in, fact, in fact, that's how I used to spell it because so many of the papers that I initially read were in French. I just got used to spelling it. Or in English, too. It's also possible. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I don't think Milner's Ah, good point. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe he, he never mentioned the Milner fiber per se, right? Because that would have been a little bit arrogant, right? So, so I, I want to talk. How long is this talk? Two and a half. Okay. We think that clock is right. Yeah, okay. So I, I want to talk about, you know, Milner vibrations. Um, I want to talk about their topology um, for some specific uh, class of hypersurfaces. So I'm, I'm going to talk about projective hypersurfaces, projective complex hypersurfaces. Um, so I should say something about what my guys are. These are realizations of matroids or hyperplane arrangements. Um, and then most of the... Um, Invariants I'm going to look at topologically are, are homological. So. so I got to mention something about homology of abelian covers um, given by understanding the base of some covering space. Um, and Part of the moral of the story is that these uh, Milner fibers of, of hyperplane arrangements are, are somehow um, more interesting than um, the, another topological space which you associate with arrangements, namely the hypersurface complement, uh, which is something well understood. So the, I don't know, pathological or interesting, it's, it's a, up to, we can discuss it in the Indian restaurant, but um, some behavior is going to come up that, uh, that you know, is a little bit surprising, and, and we'll see, you know, some conjectures that things were really nice turn out to be false. Um, and some of this will be uh, um, discussing, I'll forget it in the talk, so I'll say some of this is joint work with uh, Alex Suchio. <laughs> Since he seems to be in the audience. Um, right, so... So, so let's imagine a homogeneous polynomial of degree a, um, n in, in a polynomial ring with L variables. Um, and um, there, there are a couple of things that you can consider. Um, There's the hypersurface itself. Um, I could consider um, the uh, projectivization of the hypersurface, which I'll, I'll just put a little bar on my f if I mean the projective version. So that's a projective hypersurface. Um, complement and the projective complement. Um, so the, uh, you know, the usual game is that you know, my hypersurface should be singular. Um, the the complement is, is some open complex manifold. Um, then we, we have a fundamental result that the evaluation map of this uh, polynomial 
on its uh, non-zero locus um, is a fibration. And the, uh, the Milner fiber in question then is the typical fiber of this vibration. And since all my fibers are created equal, I'll fix the one over the point one. Um, and so this is a special setting because I'm, I'm talking about the you know projective hypersurface. So this is a global Milner fiber, um, which, which has a right to exist. So, um, of course, you know, these guys are, um, you know, they've got extra properties coming from the, uh, the homogeneity, this projective setting. In particular, um, there's a, particularly explicit monodromy operator here. Um, this is living inside uh, um, complex space is a diagonal action of a root of unity. So if I have a degree n polynomial and I multiply all the variables by the same root of unity, as long as that root of unity is a multiple of a degree, um, then if I pull it out, it just disappears. So. Um, So this restricts to a um, automorphism of the Milner fiber. So, pardon me for peeking at my notes. Oh yeah, right. So then the guys I'm interested in are uh, going to be products of linear factors. So it's a special case. Alex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where do I? Well, as you said, right. Um, so, right, so what's my, uh, let's see. So the projective complement, so this is in, you know, three, or two variables, so if I projectivize, I'm in P1, if I, cut something out of P1, each of these components um, gives me a point in P1. So it's a little bit too small to be very interesting, but um, should always write down the easiest possible case. Um, here's my Milner fiber. I get that by setting this equal to one. I've got some kind of um, smooth but non-compact thing. Um, I guess if you wanted to, if you do your exercise, you could, you could uh, close it up in projective space by um, homogenizing um, <coughs> instead of setting it equal to one you could write down a homogeneous equation like this and just not allow t to be equal to zero so look at that in a certain chart and that'll give you a picture of what this Milner fiber looks like um, so can we do that well let's see so I guess this is a cubic a degree three polynomial homogeneous polynomial so that gives us a elliptic curve um, except that, you know, it's a little bit bigger than the thing I started with because I was insisting that t not be equal to uh, zero. So um, this affine Milner fiber is really an elliptic curve um, minus three points. And you can see the three points if I set this equal to zero. It was the original three points, the uh, hyperplanes in the arrangement. This isn't true in general, but, you know, and then if you like topology, you take your elliptic curve and you poke three holes in it, and then you see up to homotopy, it becomes a wedge of uh, three, four spheres? Um, four, I think. Yeah. And so then you realize that actually this is a old, very old story in disguise because this was actually an isolated singularity, and Milner also told you that the Milner fiber of an isolated singularity really is a wedge of spheres. So, so th this is, you know deceptive because in the isolated case it's extremely well understood and fundamental. Um, and so what I want to do is increase the dimension and still 
look at these guys which split as linear factors, um, find some combinatorics governs the behavior of this, and, and see what happens um, to this Milner fiber. So that's, that's been on the mathematical table for about 35 years, um, but it's still not, uh, um, surprisingly not fully understood. So let's talk about the projective hypersurfaces I wanted to consider. Um, so let's see, linear factors, right? Um, one, one way to set this up is to um, build things a little more systematically by um, encoding each of the factors in a, in a linear map. change of notation. Um, so if I have a linear um, map like this, then I could make a polynomial by considering the uh, coordinate functions these are then going to be functions in n variables, but linear functions. And this will give me um, something like I claimed. Um, so how does that go? Well, So if I, you know, I make my linear map by left multiplication by this matrix, then if I write down what are the coordinate functions, um, you know, the first one is x, the second one is y, and then the third one is x minus y. Um, so you can define um, your hyperplanes, your, sorry, your uh, um, hypersurface uh, by restricting this image. Namely, um, if I just look at where the image of alpha is zero in some coordinate, that means I lie on one of these hyperplanes. And then complementarily, if I wish to define my arrangement complement, I take this linear space and then I just restrict it um, to the portion of C to the N where none of the coordinates are zero. Did I, did I generate needless confusion? I feel kind of like I did, but, um, you know, so I, I, I'm, I'm saying that there's two ways to consider, you know, this, let me draw the picture inside V of the three lines, x equals zero, y equals zero, and x equals y. Um, and I, very equivalently, I could think of this in a three-dimensional space as the intersection of coordinate hyperplanes in C3 um, with the, uh, um, complex open torus, C star to the N. Okay, so that's a hyperplane arrangement. Specifically, what are these hyperplanes? Well, um, of hyperplanes is called a hyperplane arrangement. And so if you, if you, uh, you know, you prefer to think, what, what's the data here really? You know, I've got a, um, a matrix with, with no rows which are all zero. Um, I didn't say that, but it's kind of stupid if that happens. And so then um, the combinatorics comes up in the uh, 
possible linear dependencies amongst these rows. This is, this is what you'd call a matroid, this, this data. Um, and maybe the associated space is, is um, the arrangement's complement. And if you want the projective version, um, of course, I can just take the quotient by a diagonal C star action, either in here or, or back in here. Um, yeah, there's a, that's, that's a fine point. Um, there's this notion for arrangements of, is the arrangement essential? Um, so this somehow makes all arrangements essential. Um, if this is not injective, um, then I've forgotten um, the possibility that the intersection of all the hyperplanes in here um, might be more than just zero. So that's, yeah, that's, that's painless. Um, so I would encourage you not to think about it. But <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, oh yeah, right, so let's, let's do a real example, which will actually confuse Alex, because here's a nice arrangement. Um, uh, I'll explain why it's confusing. So if I, if I write down the Vandermond determinant, um, th these are the type A roots, right? Um, so th that's kind of a nice polynomial that splits into linear factors. Um, and it turns out that's pretty interesting. If you write the corresponding matrix, um, you know, with entries which are ones and minus ones and the rest zero in all possible ways, yeah, that doesn't actually define an injective map, right? There's a, there's a one-dimensional kernel. But let's just pretend that doesn't happen. Okay, so, so how about this guy? Well, right. Um, What is this? Well, it's actually a bit of a mystery. This is one of the, um, as uh, Mario Salvetti said, it's a scandal that, say, the, the Betty numbers of this Milner fiber are not even known in general um, because this has somehow got extra structure, group action and all that kind of thing, geometric motivation. Um, and yet, um, by, by its nature, it's, 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 it's kind of a, um, one of the most difficult things to look at. So, so what is it? Well, if, I guess, you know, let's just think for a minute. You set the Vandermond determinant equal to 1. What does that even mean? Well, actually, we could probably just think about a, the real locus. Um, Well, the uh, points in the complement aren't hard to think about. Those are n tuples x1 up to xn, where each of those variables takes on the value, the complex number. And, the, and, and if, the, uh, if you're in the complement, that means that none of these differences is zero, so all those points are distinct. So that's, that's the configuration space of n ordered points in C, if you like. Um, so that complement's been around a long time. How about the Milner fiber? So again, I'm looking at points in C to the uh, L plus 1. Um, so I want a L plus one tuple of complex numbers with the property that the Vandermond determinant has determinant one. So what is that? Well, I guess these are really points on a moment curve, right? Um, I've evaluated the coordinates on the moment curve, and I've asked that the, uh, the volume of the, uh, of the parallel of pipette or whatever they generate is one. So, you know, renormalize. You could say the simplex um, has constant volume. So I want all tuples on the moment curve where the simplex has constant volume. Um, I guess that's a real story I'm telling now. But so what is that configuration space? Well, that's the Milner fiber of this, uh, of this polynomial. So, This uh, hypersurface uh, hyper complement 
is, is nice in the sense that uh, um, it has a minimal um, CW structure. There exists a perfect Morse function. up to homotopy. Um, it's, a, it's a Stein manifold, um, so the CW complex actually is, N, is L dimensional, where L is the complex dimension of V. So it's real two L dimensional, so it's sort of a half dimensional space um, with a perfect Morse function. Uh, it's formal in the sense of Sullivan, rationally formal. Um, the uh, uh, F is a product of linear factors. So this hyperplane arrangement complement is a, is a good guy. Um, The uh, cohomology is known even integrally, um, combinatorially presented, and in particular torsion free. So, so this is nice. Is uh, so maybe you, you could ask, and, and it was asked in the 90s, is, is the Milner fiber of a hyperplane arrangement nice in some sense too? In, could, could you compute its cohomology? Um, is it minimal? Um, is it torsion free? Um, and it turns out that the answers are heuristically not nice. Um, but only sometimes. Sometimes it's nice. So, so let's talk about that. Um, let's, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I should talk about these, uh, um, how you think about, say, the homology or cohomology of a cyclic cover um, today, and then talk about some easy cases. So, so let, let's just think, think abstractly. So x is going to be my complement, but I, I, you know, I'm going to say take a complement, which is a um, Something friendly for topology, a um, finite type connected CW complex. Um, oh, I mean, there's a finite number of cells in each dimension. Oh, okay. And in fact, without loss, we could just say even a finite CW complex, but, but this is really all you need to um, make most things work nicely. So then let's let G be the fundamental group. So I'll assume it's not simply connected, or this would be boring. These, these arrangement complements are not simply connected. They're part of the background story is that the fundamental group of the complement is usually something interesting. So, um, so covering space theory, if I had a, let's, let's restrict to abelian covers. Um, I can make a regular cover with deck transformations A. Um, X and chi are different letters. Um, And then it's more or less um, possible to compare the homology of the cover with the homology of the base. So, um, so 
at least if you work with an algebraically closed field, um, if it's positive characteristic, I want it to not divide the order of this, this uh, abelian group. Otherwise, maybe you expect something bad will happen. Um, but if, if you proceed like that, when I write homology, I'm not going to put any indices unless I have to. So I'll just put a little dot, right? So this means as a graded abelian, um, as a graded vector space, by Shapiro's lemma or the Serre spectral sequence or something, you get an isomorphism of this form that says that the uh, homology of the cover with trivial coefficients is the homology of the base with, uh, with uh, coefficients in some representation of the fundamental group. Um, and then I'm going to invoke, uh, um, is it Maschke's theorem or Schur's lemma? I think it's Maschke's theorem. I somehow never remember the difference. But I'm going to say that this here finite dimensional representation of an abelian group decomposes into one dimensional irreducibles, right? So finite abelian group. Yeah, right? Good. Yep. Um, oops. Yeah. Invisible hypothesis there. Right. And to get one-dimensional irreducibles, you do a, I think of it as a Fourier transform, right? You take the uh, group homomorphisms into the non-zero elements of the field. And then um, this parameterizes the uh, one-dimensional representations that arise. And, and further, you know, this is, I, I split up this object, but um, A, is not just a, um, an abelian group, but it's a, it's a module over G. There's a, there was a homomorphism. So if I wanted to, I could also think of these um, one-dimensional representations as indexed over um, one-dimensional representations of the fundamental group that factor through A. Um, just by composing maps and um, these, these hats reverse arrows. So, um, yeah, whatever it is, it's, it's, a, it's a recipe. Um, so I can compute the homology of the cover using um, some information about one-dimensional representations of the fundamental group of the base. Um, yeah, so what about that? All right, so then back to the Milner fiber. fiber lives inside the affine hypersurface complement in this projective homogeneous setting. Um, so when I use the projectivization map, um, I land inside the projective complement. And it's an exercise to see um, that this is a, actually a, a covering. Um, there are n points given by translations by roots of unity diagonally, um, which land on the same point down here. So the deck transformations are the uh, given by the monodromy. dimensional irreducible representations of a cyclic group of order n. So maybe I'll, I'll number them like this. 
if I think about indexing the representations over irreducibles of the cyclic group. Or, or if you like, um, these are also given by one-dimensional irreducibles of the fundamental group. And I have to say what delta is. I guess there's some classifying map for this, uh, this cover, which I should call delta. And g must be the fundamental group of this projective hypersurface complement. So maybe I should just pause to see if I can say anything that makes that better. <laughs> My dot looks like a zero. You could say that, right? At least that's a criticism. Yeah. So, so in any case, there's n factors in, in each case. Um, I, I, I chose my field to um, have characteristic not dividing n, and then this all goes through. Um, so, yeah. Well, you have to pick generators for G in order to say what that means. But if if uh, this actually factors through the abelianization of G because this is a map to an abelian group, and then the abelianization of G. That's a good point Alex makes. As always, can be identified with H1 with integer coefficients. And then you can find a preferred basis in there um, where each of these generators um, maps to the same thing, the class of one in, in this quotient. Um, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a longer story which I, I suppress, but you know, the, the role of that C star to the N, that torus we, we mapped into, um, can, can be brought into this story to, to see that these things sort of can be written down um, nicely. But I, easy to say too much about that. <laughs> okay, so what about the homology of the Milner fiber? So, so isn't it done right? So okay, so we said the base was nice. The homology of the Milner fiber of an arrangement or any complex projective hypersurface is given by some data involving the base. So what? Well, th these, these aren't, that's not a trivial representation. And I, I mean that in a technical sense. Um, so you know, you have to understand cohomology of the uh, base with uh, non-trivial local systems. And, and that might be, as it sounds, non-trivial, right? So, so we could talk about these easy cases, though. That matrix, which represented the arrangement, uh, it's supposed to be taller than it is wide. I guess that's not important, but there was one row for each, uh, each coordinate for each hyperplane. Um, if, uh, you know, I can write it in some block form by a change of basis, um, where... So that, that would mean you have a, some very... You have, an, uh, you have a, a function defined hyperplane arrangement in a, some variables, and then you've got some different variables. Yeah. Yeah, sort of, it's an analogous to a Tom Sebastiani kind of construction, right? So if I took this and then excuse my handwriting, but you know, if this were my polynomial and I could separate it into two blocks of variables like that, um, that's called decomposable. If, moreover, the number of pieces in each block um, are relatively prime, um, then all the fun goes away. Um, in, it becomes an easy case in the sense that uh, um, yeah, the easy cases are fun, and the hard cases are fun in a different way. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Did Nimmin do this a long time ago? Speaking of Sebastiani Tom, like formulas of his products. Is, is it literally a join? I don't, I don't think so, sum, no. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a product. So I, I don't, it's not a join. It's, it's more like a product, actually. Um, so, oh, I should give a name.
since I said these were um, one-dimensional representations um, which were um, one-dimensional representations of the deck transformation group, the cyclic group, um, then another way to put that is that they are eigenspaces for, for this guy in homology. That's the generator of the cyclic group. The cyclic group acts in homology. Um, and so it's, I, I assume the field was algebraically closed, so it's got one-dimensional eigenspaces. So when I mean eigenspace, I'll write the eigenvalue down here um, just to avoid writing this big thing, right? So, you know, the, the eigenspace for one, then, is a trivial representation. Um, so that's pretty nice. Uh, so to some extent, Yeah, I know. You're wondering if I'm just being annoying, right? But I'm not. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pull out one other than C, but for right right now just yeah, think C. C's fine. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, with with this hypothesis, then the uh, the uh, um, only monodromy eigenspace which is non-zero is the trivial monodromy eigenspace. So then that representation is actually the trivial representation. And that direct sum decomposition says that the homology of F is the same as the homology of the complement, um, which turns out to be the homology of the complements, the product of those two complements. So um, that's, yeah, that's an easy case. So um, studied by Papadima and Dimka. Um, yeah, comment? It's kind of the, the genetic case of some steps, right? Because you get the genetic polynomials in some steps. Do generic polynomials split up? No, I mean, it happens even if the, right? Well, no, something else happens. But let, let's do another case, which I'll, I'll call generic in the technical sense. And, the, the, you know, I, 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 I have to make a point about this. So um, let's see. So, you know, I've got here me uh, an N by L tall matrix. Um, we'll say it's generic if all the uh, maximal minors are non-zero. So this is this, it's a, known as a re representation of the uniform matroid. Um, and so, of course, that is sort of generic in, the, in the, any suitable sense, right? Um, so you have to watch out that you don't assume that all arrangements are generic, because some people sort of think of that. You know, these guys have, uh, you know, the hyperplanes meet um, transversely, you know, normal crossings um, in the projective setting everywhere. and so. You know, that, that is very abundant because, you know, if you choose one at random, it's going to look like that. But these are not the interesting ones. Um, oh, let's see. So, I, pardon my, yeah, Tony's going to be annoyed because a little f here is a polynomial that depends on a. So maybe I should say f is the f that depends on a given by taking the, linear forms corresponding to the rows of that matrix and multiplying them up. So then the Milner fiber there, um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's not generic in the algebraic geometry sense. Well, actually, maybe it is. I mean, a generic matrix would do, um, except then we'd have to change the field um, because we wouldn't be talking about C. But if we did it over a function field, then it could be a generic matrix. Um, yeah, but you're saying a larger class, which I would not consider generic, but not Yeah, fair enough. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, the term representation of the uniform matroid is probably the way to go. Um, so... Um, yeah, it turns out then the Milner fiber is, is uh, comparatively easy to understand. Um, Orlick and Randall showed that it's uh, um, homotopic to the, uh, the uh, projective complement, and that's a pretty easy thing as, as well, um, wedge some top dimensional spheres. Does it say anything if the maximum liner is vanished only at the origin? Um, right, so called paving matroid. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, um, yeah, well, you could sort of cheat. Um, let, let me tell you how. So that with this result, um, another way to access a slightly weaker statement, just, just the homological statement is, uh, is that these guys agree in homology up to uh, um, just below the top dimension. Um, in other words, the uh, monodromy eigenspaces are, are all trivial um, for P less than the top dimension. And in the top dimension, something else happens. So, um, It's not too important exactly what happens, but there are some non-trivial monodromy eigenspaces at the top, and the number of them is the um, unsigned Euler characteristic of the projective complement, which in this case turns out to be a binomial coefficient. Um, and th that goes back to a paper of Hattori in 74, who, who considered uh, cohomology of, of rank one local systems on the complement of these uh, so-called generic arrangements. Yeah, yeah. Hattori showed that, uh, yeah, this, this is the skeleton of a torus, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm phrasing things homologically, but, you know, sometimes there's something stronger um, that doesn't fit in with the plot of my talk, so I'm just kind of sweeping it under the rug. Um, but this is the last time where we actually know something about the homotopy type of the space. So, um, yeah, in general, you don't. Okay, so th those are the easy cases. Um, so what's, what's not easy? Well, you know that Vandermond there, I told you that's not easy. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, Betty numbers are open. Um, so that, that's, that's an instance of a, of a complex reflection arrangement. Um, and reflection arrangements are, are, you know, one of the motivating examples of hyperplane arrangements. They tend to have interesting symmetries, um, you know, highly non-generic linear dependencies amongst, the, say, the roots of the root system. And, and so all that makes this stuff kind of, um, you know, most interesting to study in that case. So um, oh, I guess you could also say there are some constraints that are, that are rather deep. Um, H1, that's not a dot, that's a 1, something special happens. The uh, uh, non-trivial monodromy eigenspaces can only be of order 1, 2, 3, or 4. Um, don't roll your eyes, that's your theorem, Alex. Well, we know what the order of the monodromy is, but let's put it this way. Um, so if... Uh, Monodromy eigenvalue can only have such an order. Yeah. Yeah, of course, a, a cyclic group of high order can factor through Z mod 2. That's sure it can. For any yes, for any arrangement. Uh huh. Is that fair to call it Papadima Suchu 14? Yeah. So. So, so here's another pathology. The uh, arrangement complements were torsion free. Um, and that actually follows not just by direct computation, but it's a. Um, 
because they have a perfect Morse function, they, they have to be. Um, so it, it turns out that uh, um, the Milner fiber doesn't have to be torsion free. Um, it, it was conjectured by Randall that they were. Um, more generally, uh, Dimka and Nemethy conjectured that uh, if you had a projective hypersurface complement with torsion free homology, then it's Milner fiber. Oh, I think they called it a question. I shouldn't call it a conjecture. The, the Milner fiber was torsion free as well. Anyhow, the answer to both of those is no um, via an, an example from arrangements. Um, so let's see. So we saw some examples where the homology is torsion free. Um, but to, to see it doesn't need to be, um, well, it's a bit of a long story, which I, I, I don't want to spring on you in the last 10 minutes of a talk. But let me just give you a little hint how that goes. Um, so this will answer Dave's question, you know, what, what's up with the K, the field of characteristic not necessarily zero? And, and so, of course, that's for this, right? So um, sounds kind of simple-minded, but um, you know, how do you, how do you find torsion and homology? You know, think, work with field coefficients, but you know, vary the field. So, um, uh, why, why you need algebraically closed? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we 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 actually depend on that splitting. So let, let me show you how that goes. So we we need to. Uh, invoke a little bit of machinery. Um, if x is a finite type, CW, connected CW complex, um, and g is uh, pi 1 of x, then we, to study one-dimensional local systems on x, then it's useful to construct um, some auxiliary um, devices, which turn out to be varieties. Um, Let's consider all the one-dimensional representations of the fundamental group for which the uh, ith Betty number um, with coefficients in the local system given by that representation um, is non-zero. So would it be fair to call Alex one of the pioneers of this subject? Um, possibly, yeah. So these are called the characteristic varieties of X. And there's, there's a whole lot you can say, which I won't, but um, we just need to borrow a little bit of this stuff here. Um, so this uh, you know, group of homomorphisms from G to K, um, the non-zero elements of K, is an algebraic group. Um, and this is a Zariski closed subset. So you need to work with some fitting ideals to see why that's so. Um, but so these are actually varieties defined over K. Another reason why I like K to be algebraically closed. Um, and because they come from, uh, um, you know, things to do with the fundamental group. If you know Fox calculus, for example, you could sort of imagine, you know, how would you try to answer the question of when is this non-vanishing? Um, then you end up with equations um, over the integers. And that's, that turns out to be kind of important. So these are, these are varieties over k, um, but they, they were defined by integer equations. So you can think of it as a scheme over z, if you like. But um, then they, they help you if, you if you peek into them. Um, good thing this is still around here. Um, these were the things we were looking for, right? So these... Um, in order to check to see if some particular row um, appears in the cohomology of a Milner fiber, I just have to check to see if row is in the corresponding characteristic variety, if I knew what it were.
So to compute the, com or the homology of the Milner fiber over a field of arbitrary characteristic, um, if I knew these uh, characteristic varieties, um, then you know, they, they'd tell me the answer, more or less. Um, and in particular, if the answer differed when I changed k, um, then I would know I had some torsion. So the characteristic varieties are, are Oh, pardon me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean the uh, the abelian cover that we like in this talk is that cyclic cover, namely the finite cyclic cover, the Milner fiber. But in general, you know, you can set this up for any abelian cover. Um, so then, um, if I imagine schematically my character torus for the fundamental group being drawn like some torus, um, then if uh, x is special, like it's um, um, quasi-projective variety, then there are qualitative results about you know, what the characteristic varieties look like. They're, they're unions of uh, subtori. Well, not quite. Unions of subtori translated by torsion, um, part of the theory that goes back to Arapura. Um, and yeah. Uh, in characteristic zero, yeah, and, and if k is not characteristic zero, we don't know, but we have to, you know, work sort of ad hoc. But um, here, here's what could happen, right? Um, so suppose I had a trivial representation, um, and then some component which was, you know, a little subtorus, um, but it didn't contain the identity. Uh, is translated by an element of order two. So very, very heuristically, um, if I looked at this in characteristic two, then something funny would happen. Um, you know, that would disappear um, because minus one equals plus one. Um, Of course, you can't draw a picture in characteristic two, but um, the, the idea is that, you know, as you vary the characteristic of the field, if you set this up correctly, um, then, then you may find that uh, um, some part of the characteristic variety um, collapsed or, or did something funny. And so then if, if uh, moreover, I was interested in um, one of these covers, the uh, image of the uh, classifying map is some subgroup here, some abelian sub, discrete abelian subgroup of G hat, finite even, which is you know, some collection of points. And then I was interested in, did the points lie in the characteristic variety or not? And you can see the answer could change. Um, so then, So then by, by constructing carefully, you could find arrangements with this kind of behavior um, and then set it up so that you, you got some you know, two torsion in H1, is there, or arbitrary torsion, but the simplest is to make two torsion. And I could write down explicitly an example, but it's not too illuminating. Um, the, one the trouble with this that you might complain about is that the polynomial isn't reduced. There, there are uh, factors that have multiplicity in that calculation. Some people don't. I like those hyperplane arrangements because that means the hyperplanes are being repeated. Um, so if you, if you say, well, okay, yeah, that's not what we really meant in those conjectures. Can you do it with a hyperplane arrangement um, where all the hyperplanes are distinct, where there are no multiplicities? Then, then you have to work harder. And so Alex and I did that uh, not too long ago um, and found that uh,
by, by some rather elaborate combinatorial machinations, um, you can pull this off and find um, if uh, n equals, no, n equals, if you take 27 hyperplanes in an eight dimensional space, then you can find that uh, H6 of the Milner fiber contains two torsion. Of order 108. Um, yeah, well, we couldn't improve on that. So that's the, the, the nature of the construction was it kind of bloated things. Um, so it, I guess it remains to ask, could you, you know, is, this, is it really so hard or could you do it in H1 or something like that? So that, that's unknown. So when was that result? Uh, when did you do that? This is 2014-15. Uh, Safe to say the jury was out. I, I think I think maybe I heard at least one guy say, "Oh yeah, but that's not what we meant." You know, that's not a yeah, you know well. a hyperplane arrangement's always reduced, right? So yeah. So. What sort of arrangement? Um, <laughs> well, what you you start with um, you start with the B three root system, and you delete a short root. Uh, that gives you eight hyperplanes in rank three, and then you put some weights on it, and you could do that example over there. Um, but instead of doing that, um, you, you, you make some kind of uh, um, ancillary construction that, that uh, fattens up um, instead of increases multiplicity. And so then you end up adding lots and lots of additional hyperplanes and increasing the rank. Um, but it, it's grown up from, from uh, uh, a deletion of the B3 arrangement. Polarization. Polarization is, is if, if you work with you know, monomial ideals, it's basically that idea. It uses parallel connection of matroids and um, you have to keep it a little bit organized so you can keep track of what actually happens. But um, yeah, so, so I, I was also supposed to talk about uh, formality. So let me spend 30 seconds. Um, yeah, so uh, um, the hyperplane complement is, is formal and, oh, oh right, so this means that this, uh, this guy doesn't admit a perfect Morse function in particular. Um, yeah, formality. So. Um, Oh, never mind. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. Well, let's. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions, comments? I have questions, but I'll hold them off on mine until other people have a chance. I'm curious what you can say about phasing ratios. Yeah. In so. In particular, is there, I don't know, what happens if the bit is the Jacobian ideal is exactly the maximum? Um, I think the, uh, the uh, support of the Jacobian ideal should be in co-dimension two, so it shouldn't be the maximal ideal. Um, but uh, but those those guys are um, they they have some good behavior in that uh, they look like the generic arrangement except in the top two homological dimensions. So I I think it's reasonable to guess that the uh, Milner fiber has trivial, only trivial monodromy eigenspaces um, in dimensions except the top two dimensions. Um, and then up there, it's not clear we'd know what they were. So, so yeah, I'm not sure that a, um, say a, a, an explicit determination of the homology equipped with monodromy action is, is uh, anyone knows that, but um, it, it sounds like a tractable case unlike some of these other guys. Other, okay. yeah, go for it. Yeah. What does it have to do with the critical points of the master function? Yeah, it's a good question, right? So there's a, you know, from some physics point of view, if you pick your arrangement correctly and modify the configuration spaces, you might be interested in um, thinking about Evaluating a product of linear forms to uh, to uh, exponents, which start off being integers, make it a rational function, but then you could even make it a multi-valued function by making those complex. Um, and so, the, the Milner fiber, I guess, is a fiber of one of these guys. Um, though, 
the, um, you know, this, is, this has been studied. As, as it gives you something called the maximal likelihood variety in the um, work of Sturmfels. Um, you know, quite a bit is known about that, but no one's ever, as far as I know, said anything coherent that integrates the Milner fiber and the critical points of the master function. Did you have a paper with Bachenko and Cronin and Hoff? But it wasn't coherent. No, no, there was no Milner fiber in that paper. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's, it's close, yeah. Because you, you do find that critical points of these things are related to uh, um, points in the characteristic variety. So, but not in a very one-to-one -one kind of way, unfortunately. But yeah, it's a good question, yeah. Oh, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, what? What's the formality result? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not hiding a theorem. I, I didn't, I, I was, I was just about to say, by, by no work of my own, um, <laughs> that uh, the, the Milner fiber um, may be formal. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, uh, it, it's mixed Hodge structure is pure in certain cases by work of Dimka and Papadima, in particular in the presence of this totally trivial monodromy. Um, but then by work of one of Dimka students, uh, Huge Zuber, um, it's known that for one of the reflection arrangements, the Milner fiber is not formal. Um, and you can, you know, somehow the non-pure mixed Hodge structure comes into that story. Um, th there, there seems to be more to say about formality of Milner fibers. Of, um, I was, um, perhaps not by me though, maybe <laughs> by you, right? It's, it's good to have problems for students, right? So, yeah. For, for the complement, they are known. Um, and, for and for the Milner fiber, not. Right. Not right. The, I, except for small bonds. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can sort of compute it by hand up to about uh, um, n equals 7. Are, are, the, are which like, eigenvalues of monotomy that appear now? The, uh, the, of course, the constraint is if I'm looking at. Uh, a configuration space of L plus 1 points, um, then the polynomial has degree L plus 1 choose 2. So the monodromy group has that order. So then um, the eigenvalues divide that, but that's not very interesting um, in the sense that um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying something silly. But, right. but uh, um, and in degree 1, you know, they have to be, um, they could only be 3 by this previous discussion. And so the degree H1 of the Milner fiber in this family, I guess, is, is known um, uh, together with its monodromy decomposition. But higher up, um, it's, uh, that's where it gets dicey. And then I'm not sure if it's not at least 100%. Because of these torsion points, like Archie varieties, the isolated points, which are not known. Oh, even for H1, eh? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it, that's okay. So it's, it's, just a, it's a bit delicate, yeah. Um, right. Perhaps one could come up with some better constraints on the order of the eigenvalues without referring to the machine that has an incomplete um, description, but I don't know. So my question, which may be more of a question for Alex, I somehow missed this result of his with, I think you said Papadema, but the, the order of the roots of unity of the monodromy in degree one have to be, has to be one, two, three, or four. Are there constraints known in higher degrees? Or I know one is special. That's, that's H1 a, that's one a, is special, but is there anything like that? It's any part, of, part of the talk I deleted. I was, a, I was also going to say that you could achieve uh, monodromy eigenspaces of arbitrary order um, if you're willing to go above H1. So that H1 phenomenon is, is, uh, is very, very special. special. Yeah. You mean you can make them arbitrary in H2? You could make or them, you can of make, course. If they, you go high enough, you can always. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there's something a little bit cheap. At the very top, of course, you could have any monodromy eigenvalue for right. sort of not very interesting reasons, but even further down. So. <laughs> Right. 
Right. So then by this is gone. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't know what the, they could be isolated points, but they, but they, they don't touch the this, uh, yeah. the, the character that gives you the Milner fiber. Yeah. Right. Any other questions, well, comments? I one question. Uh, I was curious about uh, what kind of a constraint is it if you have a family of hyperpetaramus and insist that the ligand must be constant in the family? Can you use your example to produce uh, arrangements to non homomorphic uh, Milner fibers? For the Sorry, with, with you what, didn't with know what, what lay numbers are? Lay, oh, lay numbers. Oh, you have a paper on that, right? Um, on lay numbers and hyperplanar Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah with yeah. five other authors. Uh, so my only really ridiculous, jo ridiculously joint paper. I, yeah. I can't remember if those, were those combinatorially determined for arrangements? Or they are combinatorially not? determined yeah. for arrangements. Yeah. So then if you... Which if, is why it was interesting to all those, all these combinatorialists. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I remember that much of it. Right. Um, yeah. So, so you're saying if, if I if I move the arrangement, um, but keep the combinatorics constant? Yes. Yeah. yeah. At least that's what your combinatorics are. So, um, he's going to have trouble answering that when he doesn't know how much of the combinatorics that requires to be. Constant. Well, here's here's an evasive <laughs> answer. Um, there is a you know there is a one one problem which I didn't mention is you know is the cohomology of the Milner fiber combinatorially determined? That's that's unknown. Really? Yeah. Even, even there, the Betty numbers? There, there are partial results. Even yeah, the Betty numbers are unknown? Even the Betty numbers, yeah. So the torsion thing makes you think it's not, right? Oh, no, that's, no. that's <laughs> even that torsion came about for, not, not by some trick of the actual matrix, but by combinatorics. Okay. So. Hmm. All right, at some point we should stop. So let's thank the speaker again.